from down here, you can't see anything. You see, the nice thing about being perched in a watchtower 50 feet up in the air was that we could see the wide, open world of trees and mountain peaks that surrounded the village of Pinehaven. As its protectors, that was kind of important. But now that the tower is gone, we're confined to a pathetic little hut, no bigger than a shed and settled on the ground. It feels like we're all living in a sardine can, and the snowstorms coming from the mountain are like big shoes kicking us around. The sounds of construction were giving me a headache. I was plagued by constant fears that the portable outhouse that we all shared would tip over with a gust of wind. But worst of all, it was a week after Christmas and Daniel was still singing carols. Hey, this is Operator Evelyn, codename 28th from the Pinehaven Emergency Broadcast Station. This is a busy time for us, but I wanted to take a few minutes to tell the story of how New Year's Eve went absolutely bananas. It began the way a lot of things do around here. Early in the morning when I arrived at work with a big yawn and an even bigger travel mug of too strong coffee, I traded places with Finn, who gave me a crisp high five on his way out of the door. I've been trying to get him to move on to finger guns, but I don't think we're quite there yet. While he was heading back to the old homestead to get some well-deserved sleep, I was making sure that our morning music lineup was set for the next hour. Finn had it perfectly organized down to the second. As per usual, pre-recorded ads already slid into place. He had even cleaned all the discount post-Christmas candy wrappers off my side of the desk. I spent the next few hours settling in, giving the morning weather forecast, and practicing saying, Happy New Year in sign language. I should have known that it was about to be a weird day as soon as I saw the sunrise come up over the horizon. It was more purple than usual. The rich color of the sky remained late into the morning, surrounded by long, tendril-shaped flares like a second sun. What do they call it? Uncanny valley, I think. When something is just off enough to catch your attention, but not so strange that it looks impossible. I regarded the sunrise with a squint of suspicion, waiting for it to fade into the bright blue winter sky. It did in time. And then at 10 o'clock in the morning, the door came bursting open and a cold wind rattled the thin plywood walls. It was my worst nightmare in human form, here to haunt me yet again. Feliz Ano Nuevo, you little creep. And Daniel said energetically, pushing the door closed with his shoulder. He was still on crutches, his broken leg in a big white cast. It was covered in little sharpie drawings, most of them from me. It looked like his siblings had added a few during the Esperanza Christmas party this year. My personal favorite was a doodle of Bartholomew the Bird holding a knife. I raised my eyebrows at him over the lid of my coffee cup. I don't speak French, I teased. Dan hopped over to the desk and flopped into his usual chair, leaning his crutches up against the edge of the table. Okay, smarty. He kicked my chair with his good leg, causing me to roll a few inches to the side. I take it back then. I hope you have a terrible new year. I hope you eat a whole bag of wieners. Oh, delicious, my favorite. I rolled back into place again, curling one leg underneath me and getting comfortable. Happy new year to you too. So, how'd you sleep last night, Danny boy? He was fixing his curls which had been tossed around in the high winds. He picked up a clipboard and spun slowly on his wheels, reading over the day's notes. We had a raffle going on that he was extremely excited about. I slept great, he said, pointing to his chin. What at first looked like a scab from a bad shave turned out to be rug burn instead. And the nice thing about sleepwalking with a broken leg... You don't get very far. I cringed, squinting my one eye to look at the nasty mark. Ooh, ouch. Hey, better than getting lost in the woods though, right? Or jumping into mysterious holes. It was one singular mysterious hole and I didn't jump. 
I attempted a graceful swan dive before you interrupted. Yeah, okay. I snorted, getting out of my seat. I turned to the little coffee maker that we had plugged in beyond the desk, filled with distilled water from jugs. It was sitting on a rickety old chair that we had found in the shed. Sincere apologies, a connoisseur of strange holes. I didn't mean to offend. Do you want some coffee while I'm back here? Dan threw a crumpled up piece of paper at the back of my head. He was in a rare form today. No thanks, darling, I'm good. I'm off my butt on Monster Energy. I heard the distinct pop of a can top. I snickered, tossing the paper wide in the trash. That explains everything. While you get settled in, you want to do the raffle announcement? After, come fly with me. I didn't pre-record it because I thought you would want to do the honors. Oh, you do love me. Dan gave a huge, gab-toothed grin while he adjusted his hearing aid, making sure that it was secure before putting his headphones over top. As I pretended to gag on his cutesy BS, he started to loudly sing along with the radio, just as I had feared he would. I knew setup sucks enormous hairy butt, but if I'm being honest, it was built in an afternoon out of plywood and spare pieces from an old barn, each plank a different shade of peeling paint. There's no plumbing, no heat, and if you want to keep something refrigerated, you just stick it outside in the snow by the door. The plexiglass window out front isn't much of a lookout either. All we can see is snow in the tree line which is far darker and more foreboding from this angle than it ever was up in the air. We're packed into a space just barely large enough for all of our equipment. The old tower wasn't very big, sure, but at least Daniel and I could sit side by side without constantly attacking one another with our elbows. As I refilled my travel mug, I could hear my co-host crooning into his microphone. It's 10 o'clock on a beautiful Saturday morning and my partner and I just want to wish everybody down in Pinehaven a fantastic New Year's Eve. For tonight and tonight only, we'll be giving away a special prize to one lucky winner. To enter the raffle, call and tell us your New Year's resolution. And we'll draw the name at midnight for a $50 gift card to the Pottery Barn. I stifled a snort of laughter. Pinehaven was still rebuilding after the disaster that had happened before Christmas. There was something so pathetically hopeful about offering compensation in the form of $50 worth of a pottery. I briefly wondered what would happen if nobody called us, but I didn't say anything. It would break Dan's a squishy little heart. As it turns out though, we actually did get some calls. Bill from Chestnut Avenue wants to eat less red meat. Kendall wants to call her sister more often. Emily said she would go to a gym at Pinehaven and had a gym, but she'll settle for her long walks in the evening. Travis said that he wants to start sleeping better at night. Patricia wants to sleep better at night. Jamal wants to sleep better at night. Paige wants to sleep better at night. Anthony wants to sleep better at night. By mid-afternoon, the sky was already starting to grow dark. We could hear the distinct caw of several dozen crows perched at the tree line where the forest met the clearing. We could hear the rumble of something that sounded like thunder, but we knew that it probably wasn't. All at once, the wind stopped. The trees were completely still. The wispy dark clouds in the sky were as still as a picture. Everything got eerily, horribly silent. I stood at the window, my breath making a warm fog on the plexiglass surface. So, what about you? I heard Dad ask from behind me. What's your resolution this year? I thought about it in silence for a moment. I wanted to stop drinking entirely, maybe try therapy. I wanted a will to live, and not just for Pinehaven, but because I was happy. I wanted to figure out what made me happy. I wanted to dance. I wanted to say I love you more often to the people who matter to me. Uh, to start drinking more water. I lied. What about you? Daniel was silent for a minute before he too had an answer. Uh, maybe I'll write a book. My lip twitched in the tiniest of smiles while I watched the crows gather on the radio tower. 
The blinking red light at the top was dancing against a pure black sky, while the clock on the wall ticked loudly. I think that's a great idea, Danny boy. It was late by the time that Finn showed up, agreeing to take over for Dan and I. What's with all the crows? He asked the moment that he stepped inside, slamming the door behind him. The thin wall shuddered and the whole place shook. Yeah, they're in town too, thousands of them probably. Maybe it's an omen, Daniel said, wiggling his fingers. Also, Happy New Year, Finn. Got any resolutions? Yeah, to get all the bird crap off my car. He sighed and sat down, all three of our chairs packed in tightly side by side. He looked tired, dark circles under his eyes and his hair more gray than usual. Sometimes I suspected that Daniel and I were the cause for that, honestly. So, what have I missed? I sat back in my seat, tapping my pen against the edge of the desk. Oh, well, lots of calls. Daniel's been a popular boy tonight with his little raffle idea. We heard thunder earlier. It wasn't thunder, Finn shook his head. There's another big sinkhole at the edge of the town. You know where the old Christmas tree farm was. I narrowed my eye. Was. Yeah, well, it's in a hole. Finn continued, lighting up a cigarette and shoving the rest of the box in the front pocket of his coat. It looks like a giant ditch now, going straight down into the abandoned mine shaft. Yeah, thankfully no one was hurt. Phil's truck was gone, place was all locked up. He must have left for Christmas. Dang, I frowned, warming my hands by sticking them back inside these sleeves of my jacket. I really liked that place when I was a kid too. My dad always let me take the first swing. I thought of those mines opening up outside of town. So close to the road, it sent a chill up my spine. I think everybody else felt it too. I remembered the horrible melted screams of that amalgamate beast. It's many human torsos all crawling over one another like a centipede. It's hooves stampeding through the trees. I remembered the way that it could crack the pines in half. The Hydra. It was still out there somewhere. Missing pieces but as angry as ever. Sometimes I still saw the earth shift to the tree line. It's quiet in here. Finn said after a long silence breathing out a puff of smoke that made the view of our computer monitors hazy. Did the clock stop working? Sure enough, we all looked up at the wall and saw that the circular clock had paused. It was just a few minutes to midnight, and the minute hand had stuck on the number 11 and was twitching in place. The clock on our monitors read the same. You guys see that? I was staring out the window, slowly standing up and pushing my chair away. As I stepped towards the plexiglass, which was now beginning to fog up from the body heat stuffed inside this tiny room, I saw that purple light again. This wasn't the light from the forest, the one glowing from within a giant hole in the ground. This one floated above the trees and into the sky, flares of light popping and wiggling around it. The second sun. It grew brighter, large, perhaps closer. I heard a great and powerful drone, loud enough to make my ears hurt. And Daniel took out his hearing aid, the tiny device squealing into the open air as he dropped it on the desk. All at once, we heard a rapid ticking. The clock was moving again, racing as if trying to catch up. Our monitors began to blink. The time on the screen flickered and began to count upwards. 11.59, 11.60, 11.61. Minutes that didn't even exist. There was a loud screech from all three of our headsets, volume blaring and seemingly coming from all directions at once. We'll drink a cup. The floor began to shake beneath our feet. The lights flickered on and off, changing colors from red to orange to purple. The, the kindest yet. Crows were flying at the window, hitting the plexiglass. The glittering stars flew overhead as if the hours were speeding by. The purple glow, now drifting closer, grew so bright that it took up the entire view. For the, For the sake, sake of all, all that lang syne.
Everything in the room shut off with a loud buzz. The lights, the computer monitors, the audio console. I heard nothing except our own panicked breathing and the sound of my pulse inside my ears. Finally, there it was again. The clock on the wall began to tick. It was five minutes to midnight again. Daniel was the first one to speak. Okay, Jesus, what the heck was that? I tapped the keyboard on my computer testing to see if the screen would come back on. Nothing happened. I don't know, but I think we lost power. Crap, I'm gonna go get the generator started. I drew my coat closer around my neck, the night's chill sinking in. As I took two small steps towards the door, I reached for the handle and prepared to run out without even looking where I was going. I would be shocked to find that instead of hitting the snowy ground, my boot sank through the air with a plunge that made my heart drop all the way down to my knees. In an instant, I was dangling, holding onto the door handle for dear life. I felt the wind blowing against my legs, the cold air whistling in my ear. I was looking up at the open doorway where Finn was already rushing to the edge to grab my arms. The old worn hinges of the door were starting to protest against my weight. Evelyn, let go, Finn yelled, gripping my arms right below the elbows. Uh, no, I yelped, my voice coming out as a panicked squeak. Screw you. Trust me, let go or you and the door are going to drop. I looked down. I really shouldn't have looked down. We were floating at least a half mile above the forest, dirt and roots dangling from the bottom of the shed, as if it had been plucked off the ground. Below us, that magenta light coming from that endless pit was shining brightly like a round burst of color, an eye looking up into the stars. I was hyperventilating, my head beginning to spin, the world turning on its side as I grew dizzy and faint. When I looked back up at the door, Finn wasn't there anymore. Somebody else had taken his place. I saw a thick red beard and tan of freckled skin, a yellow and orange fireman's coat. He was holding my elbows tightly, nodding his head with a comforting and reassuring smile. I've got you, Ginger Snap. He said, but you gotta let go. I'm gonna fall. The voice that came out of my mouth wasn't mine. It was tiny, young, and childlike. You ain't gonna fall, darling. Trust your pa, I've got you. I braced myself and teeth clenched. Before I could have a chance to doubt my decision, my hand released the doorknob and I felt my weight shift suddenly and starting me. My eyes squeezed shut as I was pulled upwards, my stomach hitting the edge of the doorway first, before the rest of me had toppled onto something warm and human-shaped. He didn't smell like Dad anymore. He smelled like cigarette smoke and pine. Finn gave me a pat on the back, pushing me by the shoulders to ease me off of him so that he could stand. I clutched my chest, sitting in the middle of the floor and struggling to breathe. And Daniel was out of his chair at this point sitting on his butt halfway to the door as if he had either fallen or tried to scoot instead of using his crutches. I think I'm having a panic attack, he wheezed. You're always having a panic attack. Finn grabbed Daniel under the arms, pulling him up and putting a crutch under his arm so that he could stand. Lynn, you okay? I looked up at him, my sight still blurry, head still spinning. I blinked and felt a tear rolling down my cheek. Yeah, I'm okay. I sniffed as Finn grabbed my hand and pulled me up, patting my shoulders. So, um, don't go out that door, okay, fellas? I forced a small chuckle. All three of us were looking out the window now, watching the wind push us along as we floated far above the trees and just underneath the clouds. The wooden boards were creaking and whining, like a boat being rocked by the waves. The dingy hanging light above us started to buzz. The bulb crackled back to life. Our computer screens flickered. The radio static was blasting in our headsets. We heard the music again. Should all the acquaintance be forgot? A warm red light filled the sky. Thunder roaring as meteors began to fall from the heavens. 
and made the sound of whistling fireworks as they fell. We all braced ourselves while the shed began to rock, flames engulfing the trees. And that never brought to mind. And the ticking was louder now. 1162, 1163. We were falling. And the building gave one violent roll to the side like an aircraft going out of control. And suddenly we could see the flaming trees below getting closer and closer. The three of us fell into a pile on the floor, Finn grabbing the edge of the desk for dear life. Daniel was squeezing me so hard that it hurt. 1163. 1164. The impact never came. It was as if I blinked and everything was normal again. I was standing there looking out the window with the banks of snow and the tree line up ahead. I could see the clock on the wall frozen at 11.50 out of the corner of my eye. I could see the computer screens glowing bright from the corner of my other eye. Okay, now I'm actually having a panic attack. I heard my voice, but I wasn't the one to say it. I turned on a dime and saw a short, red-headed figure in a ratty old denim jacket standing behind me. She clapped her hands over her mouth and then looked at her own freckled fingers and let out a shriek. How was I standing in two places at once? Who are you? I yelled, pointing a finger. It wasn't my voice that came out of my mouth, and it wasn't my hand that was reaching. Dan, I think. The Evelyn imposter sat, holding up her hands. She, or rather he, looked at his new body and patted up and down as making sure he wasn't dreaming. Finn... Why am I a white woman? I'm not Finn. Then who? I'm Evelyn and you're me. No, I'm Dan. Holy crap, both of you guys shut up. Dan's voice boomed out with an aggression that I had never heard before. With an uncharacteristic scowl in his face, he stomped across the room with one crutch, thumping on the floor, grabbing his hearing aid and popping it back in. I swear you two each have one half of a brain cell, and you can't figure out how to rub them together. I'm Finn, you're Dan, you're Evelyn. He pointed at each of us in succession. We switch bodies. I looked down at my hands, calloused, rough, dirty around the fingernails. I was inside of Finn's body using his voice. Daniel was inside of mine. Suddenly I was tall and heavy and the back of my throat tickled from the burn of cigarette smoke. The real Finn were in Dan's physical form but still sporting that severe, intense frown on his face, put a hand on his hips and looked at the clock on the wall. If this is anything like last time, we just have to wait it out for a couple of minutes. Just try not to hyperventilate and pass out. Okay, fine, and this is fine. I took a heavy breath. Leaning against the wall, it felt weird to be so big and blocky and square. Hey Finn, your back is killing me. How old are you? In hindsight, it was hilarious to see Dan's face glaring at me with the most serious, no-nonsense expression that I had ever seen. It just wasn't like him to look like he could legitimately kick my butt. Nor was it like him to take control of a situation so effortlessly. I have to admit... I liked him more when he was just a big, dumb goof. Thankfully, the goof was still in the room with us. I don't like this, the Rio Dan said, my voice coming out of his mouth as he hunched over, uncomfortable with the new body that he was stuck in. My condolences. My head is pounding and I'm freezing and I think I bumped my nipple on the desk and it really hurts. Daniel Esperanza, don't you touch my naps. I pointed at him and he recoiled with both hands in the air, one eye wide and freckled cheeks bright red in almost an instant. God, did I actually blush like that? I wasn't gonna. He squeaked hoarsely, shoving his hands in my coat pockets to prove his innocence. I'm just saying you're very sensitive in places that I don't usually. Stop. And your mouth is really dry. Did you even drink water today? All right, you're making this weird. Meanwhile, Finn was propped up against the desk with his fingers squeezing the bridge of his nose, stuck in a shack with the two biggest idiots in the universe. 
Maybe he had a point about the whole half a brain cell thing. For, for all the things I my, my dear. The radio crackled again. A red light was coming from the screens, bright and blinding in a dark room. For, for all the things I The clock on the wall was moving again. The minute hand circling the face so quickly that it became a blur. We'll, we'll take, take a, a cup, cup of kindness yet. yet. Outside of her shack, daylight turned to night, and back again in a matter of seconds. It was like watching time race backwards impossibly fast, every sunrise and sunset burning her eyes. For the, for the sake of all the things I A bell was ringing in my ear so loud that it made my skull vibrate and my teeth chatter. I was cold, standing outside in the wind. When my two eyes adjusted, I could see the endless forest up the mountainside. The view was different than what I remembered. Same place, same mountain range, but there were no lights from the village, no concrete, no radio tower. And somewhere in those pine-covered peaks, a thick bank of fog was swirling and quickly spreading down toward the tree line. My heart started pounding. I looked down on my feet and saw buckled shoes and stockings and rickety wood floors beneath me. I was in a high tower made of planks, a massive brass bell ringing in my ear. People were yelling down below, their voices far away but the panic so familiar. Thomas! A man screamed. He was standing in the snow at least twenty feet down from where I stood. His hands cupped over his mouth to yell up in my direction. He wore a raccoon tail hat, a shotgun hanging off his shoulder. I didn't recognize him. I didn't recognize anyone. Ring the bell, you fool. Why did you stop? I looked in my hands, tanned and calloused from rough work. They were still wrapped around a thick piece of rope. I remembered a moment like this, perched on top of the old Pinehaven church, ringing the bell as if my life depended on it. It did then, and it probably did now. I pulled with my entire weight, the brass bell above my head, making a low metallic drone before it finally chimed, the sound carrying for miles and miles. The pain in my ears was impossible to ignore. My arms were burning. My hands felt like they were on fire. Somewhere in the deep and echoing hum, I heard the music on the wind. We too have paddled the stream. The fog was racing closer, tumbling over itself like rolling waves. From morning sun till night. I pulled the rope as hard as I could, the stilts under my feet shaking. My legs were growing weak. My hands were beginning to bleed. The seas between us lowered and swell. My hands slipped and the rope slid out of my grasp sending me falling to my knees. Sore, bleeding palms were flat against the wood, and the air around me was growing stale and dark. I heard the static from the headset. I heard the buzz of flickering lights up above. A light bulb struggling to come back to life. I saw the familiar floor of our tiny wooden hovel. I inspected my sore palms, seeing that the blood had gone, and then the pain was starting to fade into a memory. Still, my heart was racing out of control. Finn was sitting propped up against the wall, a hand on his chest. Daniel was next to me, lying flat on his back, and panting as if he had run a marathon. I watched him pat at his face, his body, making sure that he was back in his own self again. I think we're back home. He said between heavy, wheezing breaths. What is going on? This did not happen last year. Remember last year, it was boring and normal and it was great. Yeah, well, things are changing, buddy. Finn said, pushing himself up and cracking his back as he stood. He paused at the moment his eyes settled on the window, standing as still and frozen as a statue. I watched him, waiting for him to blink. Don't move. He whispered. My curiosity got the better of me, craning my neck over the broadcast desk just enough to see through the lookout window. 
I peered into the cold, snowy night while holding my breath, as if waiting for something to jump out and grab me. What I saw was far less violent but far more chilling. Dozens, if not hundreds of deer were standing in the clearing right outside of our shack, shoulder to shoulder and staring directly at us with dark and unblinking eyes. Some of them had extra antlers, others had additional eyes or two noses. Some had human hands instead of hooves at the bottom of their legs. I could hear their strange and haunting bellows, the thump of their steps against the frozen ground. All three of us sat completely still, afraid to move, afraid to blink. The window was clouded by hot breath, the deer huffing and puffing warm fog into the frozen winter air. The harsh glower from their eyes felt like a warning, a threat, made all the more terrifying by their uneasy stillness. They were waiting for something. All at once, we heard a jike and scrape that came from all sides. It was the sound of antlers clacking against the thin wooden walls, dragging along the chipped paint and digging into the pulp. We heard hooves stomping above, the horrible and warped groans of elk. Dust fell from the ceiling in thick clouds, the thin plywood cracking in the bulb above our heads shaking like a spotlight. And we heard the call, a great bellow that shook the whole world. Something was rising above the pines, massive and heavy and adorned with curling antlers. It was the head of that amalgamate beast, severed at the neck and larger than a house, levitating and leaving a trail of blood and sinew beneath the open, steaming wound. Its mouth opened, revealing sharp teeth that went all the way back into its throat. The sound that came out made my bones tremble. One hundred eyes opened to the sky, purple and shining like beacons. It looked at us. Its glow burst through my skull like a white-hot flame the moment one of its eyes met mine. All at once, I wasn't in this world anymore. I wasn't on this earth. I was in a place that I couldn't describe. Between time and space and life and death and everything in between, I was one with it and that thick, black blood was pounding through my veins like the roots of a tree that connected us all. It felt as if I was a part of everyone who had ever been lost to this forest, everyone who had ever made that blood sacrifice. My father, the forest rangers, the sleepwalkers, Jennifer. For her old acquaintance be forgot. I was remembering a night that I had tried to forget. It was New Year's Eve. I was drinking champagne stuck in a crowd of people that I didn't know. Jennifer was dancing with someone else. And then never brought to mind. Ten. Nine. Eight. Time was ticking down and my heart was racing. I kept my eyes in her trying to stick with someone that I knew. She looked so pretty and gold. Should, should old acquaintance be forgot. Seven. Six. Five. Four. She spotted me and gave me a huge smile, lifting up her glass. She had just had her braces removed. Her arms reached for me in a hug. For the, for the sake, sake of all the lang syne. Three. Two. One. As the crowd erupted in a cheer, I felt her lips on mine for the briefest of seconds. I didn't have a chance to close my eyes or even kiss her back. I was too surprised. She was drunk and she probably didn't realize who she had kissed. She probably forgot about it the next day. We never spoke of it again. The floor of the shed was hard and cold against my back. The dingy yellow light above our heads was swaying slowly until it stopped moving altogether. I heard that ticking again as simple, rhythmic, and normal. I sat up quickly, blinking my eye on the dim light and struggling to catch my breath. Almost immediately, I turned my gaze to the clock. It was 11.59 again. My legs felt like they had been filled with mashed potatoes, shaking weakly and numbly when I stood. And Daniel was already sitting at the broadcast desk. I handed his forehead as sweat dripped down his face. Finn had a hand on his shoulder. I think he got the effects of that light worse than we did. It's counting down again, I said breathlessly. 
huddling near my coworkers and my friends as time ticked on. 30 seconds left before midnight. Do you think it'll just keep changing forever? Daniel was squeezing my hand, shaking like a leaf in the wind. Finn was staring forward at the fresh falling snow. It glittered in the dim red light of the radio tower that loomed above. Ten seconds left. The horizon was eerily quiet. The sky was dark and the trees were still. The wind was whistling between the planks of our ramshackle broadcast station. The crows were still perched at the tree line, ruffling their feathers and calling up at the stars in wisps of snowy clouds. Five, four, three, two, one. And for the first time, we saw the minute hand click into place, and our computer monitors followed an instant later. Twelve o'clock, midnight, January 1st, 2023. I let out a breath so big and so tightly held that it burned. The hour was over. We made it to the brand new year, standing in the exact same room where it had all started. My travel mug was still warm on the desk. The pen that I had been tapping against the wood set right where I had left it. Auld Lang Syne, the Guy Lombardo version, started playing through the headphones just as it had been set. And when 12.01 appeared on the clock... The three of us finally relaxed our shoulders, like three frozen statues that had finally been released from time. Happy New Year, you idiots, Finn said. He gave me a casual side hug first and then ruffled Daniel's fluffy head of hair. Take a breather and then get the heck out of here. Go celebrate, go drink some grape juice or something. Take a nap. Taking a nap sounded great, but easier said than done. I sat down, my hands sliding down my face in exasperation. My heart had been pounding out of control, but now it was slow into the usual pitter-patter of constant, reasonable anxiety. I looked over at Dan, who still had that far-off look as if his soul had been ripped out of his body. I tapped him on the shoulder to get his attention, and signed with my hands, Happy New Year. It made him smile, finally. He signed back, picking up his half-empty energy drink, and tapping it against the ridge of my travel mug. So, bud, I raised my eyebrows. Did you remember to write down those phone numbers from the raffle? Daniel's smile disappeared and his eyes widened halfway through a sip from his can. He stared off into the distance for a few uneasy seconds, before whispering under his breath. Ah, oh, crap. This is Avalyn from the 104.6 FM emergency broadcast station. And on behalf of myself and the two idiots that I share a brain with, Happy New Year and good luck.